he is a PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, and he has been named Mary many important things as the top top 100 public intellectuals by the American Journal of Foreign Policy in 2008. He is the only Chinese political scientist listed in the most cited uh, Chinese researchers. And he has a lot of books, interesting books, that have been translated to English, Japanese, Korean, Farsi, and Albanian also, which was very interesting for me. And today he will present to us the last book which is entitled Leadership and the Rise of the Great Powers. Thanks, Professor Shetong, for being with us, and thanks for, for sharing this moment with us. And we hope this is one of the many times we can have you, and next time you can come on the summer to Chile, yeah. because it's a nice <laughs> summer, <laughs> and you can enjoy it. Thanks, so, Andres. Th so thank you, Dorothea. Uh, uh, thank you for attending the presentation of Professor Jan Books. Uh, uh, leadership and the Rise of the Great Powers, published by the Princeton University Press in 2019. So the dynamics of the, this morning conference will be as follows. Firstly, uh, Professor Jan will present the main, the main arguments of his book. Afterwards, uh, I will proceed to make a few comments, a brief comment on the book and finally there will be some time for uh, q and a so uh, there will be three rounds of question we would like to collect this question in a chat please try to breathe right sample and direct question we, we would like to uh, apologize in advance as most likely we will not have uh, the time to answer all question asked for now, I uh, would like to turn to the Professor Jan with, uh, with his presentation. Thank you, Professor Jan. Okay, thank you. And uh, first, and uh, I highly appreciate your efforts and of your center to organize this opportunity for me to share my uh, ideas with your distinguished friends. And also, I highly appreciate Professor Lopez and uh, to uh, provide this uh, uh, opportunity and uh, to have all uh, so many people attend the discussion. And uh, actually, uh, I want to know, uh, uh, the first round, I gave a presentation about my book uh, for 15 minutes or 20 minutes? Yeah, it's okay, 20 minutes. We, we, we have time. 20 minutes? So okay. Few. Okay, 20 minutes. Now, let me uh, share the... <clears throat> share the screen with you. And uh, this is the uh, cover of this book. So from this cover, you will see that, and uh, this is uh, talking about the leadership. And the actual leadership for what? And uh, I'm talking about uh, how a national leadership make a country to rise up, to catch up with the dominant power or the hegemony. So for a long time, and uh, uh, IR theorists studied uh, how a hegemon to maintain its domination or leadership in the international system. But there are very few discussion, studies about how the new power to rise up, become a new hegemon. And certainly everyone was talking about Paul Kennedy's book about the, great, the, rise of the, the rise and the fall of the great powers. But unfortunately, that book mainly talking about the why the hegemon declined. It talks about the fall of the great powers instead of, talk, instead of talking about how a power rise up. So this theory try to explain among all of these uh, 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 major powers why some country, some states, can rise up to replace the dominant power, uh, the the country. Uh, but not in others. For instance, after Cold War and the we use term and uh, uh, one superpower with uh, several major powers, then the question is that, can we tell which of the other several major power will rise up? So come to the specific issue uh, uh, question, uh, why is the China instead of the other countries to rise up? Uh, to catch, uh, uh, try, uh, uh, can 
uh, uh, can become the major power to compete with the US. So that's the theory and uh, 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 explain. Okay, now this is the basic, the uh, mechanism of the uh, explain how a country to uh, change the international uh, configuration, how they change the international norm and change the international system. And the first, the, look at this, the leadership is regarded as an independent variable. And uh, that means the type of leadership is uh, very, very, very important. It determines a country will become the strong or a country maintain the same or the country will decline. And uh, so the leadership not only make a country strong and also undermine its own country. And people may believe that no, 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 no leaders, no national leaders want to undermine their nations. That's true. They do not want to, but they do. And I don't think Trump want to undermine the United States. I don't think Trump want to make the US lose its global leadership. But his policy and the irration, his policy is not that moral. So his policy and make the U.S. loss is international leader and make U.S. economy growing slower and make the U.S. influence and decline. So actually the type of leadership will decide whether the national leadership with a country rising up or, rise, uh, uh, or, or going down. So what's the mechanism? In this certain yeah. square, the square is that that depends on how much the leadership can carry out reform in its country. For instance, and the Obama and the, have a strong desire to reform the United States. Unfortunately, he do not have that capability to implement what he planned. And the Trump has the capability to implement what he wants, but uh, actually that is not a make progress, it's a make a disaster to the US. So in that way, that's why the leadership decided a country growing stronger or declining faster. So because the, the leadership's different policy have a different impacts on their national capability, and then gradually they will change the international configuration. Certainly, it's not a short term. And we cannot say uh, the, the, the China and the catch, uh, uh, narrow the power gap with the US because of only one leader. No, it started from Deng Xiaoping and uh, um, uh, then the Jiang Zemin and then Hu Jintao and then uh, now the current leader. And what I mean, it means that Deng Xiaoping's uh, principle opening up and reform have been carrying out for several decades. So the com this country, the ruling party, and they continue to reform the country one year after another continuously for decades. So the reform make China and uh, growing faster. And if, if you compare with the US, in the last 30 years, the US didn't change that much. In the last 30 years, and the US leaders didn't reform the United States of very much. They keep their the system same, they keep many, many things that are still the same like the 40 years ago. And so that's why and the US may do did the reform better than Japan, Germany, than the other European countries. But in comparison with China, and the US did not do that much reform as China did in the last 40 years. So today in China, all of the intellectuals still strongly encourage the government. We need to reform. We reform not fast enough. We need to reform the country as fast as possible and can never stop. Reform can never be implemented. Reform will continue and forever. It can never stop. Okay, so because uh, one country's 
I mean, the rising countries did more reform than the that in the dominating power or hegemon power. So the international configuration changed, and that means uh, the power structure of the world changed. Then, along with the change of international configuration, then what changed? And it depends on the leader, international leadership. So international leader possibly change. When you have a new international leadership, the new leadership will, a new type of leadership, not a new leader, a new type of leadership, it will change the international norms. Yeah? They provide new leadership and then they will change the international norms. For instance, and uh, um, uh, um, uh, Roosevelt, and uh, after World War II, he provided, uh, for me, it's a very desirable leadership. And I call it a, a humanitarian uh, leadership. So this kind of leadership and uh, provide uh, new norms uh, based on the UN. It's called a sovereignty norms and the eco norms. And uh, then they change the international system and the change the international order. And uh, after the Cold War and the senior Bush also want to change the new order and then and with Clinton, they adopted the liberalist norms and make the world becomes with a liberalist order. Now, when Trump came to power, this international leadership changed. Trump is not the type of leadership of a human, oh, sorry, a human, a humanitarian. And he's not humanitarian leadership, and he's a, a very different type of leadership. So he shaped the international norm toward the, a very opposite direction from the liberalist order. In what way? And the American first principle, and the pro commercial protectionism, and the political isolationism, and the take no responsibility for allies, and the never uh, implement the trust, and never implement the international agreements that they signed by the US. So you see, they take the leadership to change the international norm. So now we find that the world order becomes uh, 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 different. So after they change the world out, uh, uh, norms and also change the international configuration, and then what? International system and uh, will meet with a, a trans, uh, trans, uh, transition and the transformation of the system from one type to the other type. So if we regarded the transformation of the international system, I would say it mainly transfer from what? Transfer from the international system after the Cold War, so-called post-Cold uh, post War system, or they also called a Yarta system, to what? To a new type of a, a international system. What it is, I don't know. Now people said we go back to the Cold War, and uh, I said no, this is not new Cold War. It's a new system, new order, and different from Cold War, different from post Cold War. So uh, uh, because what? Because the international leadership changed. Okay. So how? What kind of a leadership? I categorize international leadership in four <clears throat> types: human authority and uh, hegemony, tyranny, and uh, a democracy. First, I will say, and the, the type of international leadership are different from the national leadership. Because the national leadership means uh, the leadership to guiding the behavior of uh, its own people or guiding the activities within one country. So that's a different type and uh, different categories. And because that leadership is based on the, based on the, based on their uh, legitimacy, uh, uh, military power. But uh, for the international system, different. Domestic society is a hierarchical system. International system is an anarchical system. So international leadership is not elected, not selected, not uh, uh, nominated by anyone, not like a domestic, domestic leadership. So international leadership based on what? Based on their capability, based on their morality, 
spaces that are uh, very useful. So, in regarding the type of international leadership, I will I will uh, uh, divide them into four types. Human authority that's the most desirable, not very often, and uh, but we do hide. So just now I said lost will is a very typical, and uh, certainly we have uh, a very horrible one like a tyranny leadership and the Hitler will be that kind of leadership and a very typical, and then hegemon hegemony. Hegemonic leadership, like uh, uh, the, the senior Bush and uh, or the 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 the, the, the uh, Clinton and the, the hegemonic power, and then the other democracy, and this is uh, also that that uh, uh, popular like a uh, uh, hegemony, or even uh, not that uh, popular like a uh, uh, tyranny, but then we do have one, and today I think. Uh, Already, some American and uh, uh, scholars and uh, pre, uh, regarding uh, Trump as a uh, any uh, uh, leadership. So you see, this is a first type of leadership. They have a different strategic preference to dealing with to for maintaining uh, world order. So because their strategy are different, so the result of their policy and uh, will be different. So generally speaking. Human authority, human the leadership of human authority will make the world order stable and durable, and the democracy leadership will make the world chaotic and and uh, and uh, uncertain, and the tyranny and the leadership will make there's a lot of wars. A democracy may not cause a wars, and they may just make the order uh, make the the world. This, in this order, but not necessarily war. But tyranny would definitely make the world fall into war. And the hegemony and the can stabilize the world order by what? Sometimes by bullying others. And this world order and may be unfair. And many countries and dissatisfied with the order and uh, uh, shaped by the hegemonic uh, pressure. So that's, uh, that's it. So now I think uh, my time is almost up. I wrap up uh, my theory. Uh, my theory actually <clears throat> regarded national leadership of the great powers is an independent variable to explain the, the change in international configuration, international norms, international order, and the international system. So that means I use the, uh, the personal level analysis to explain the change at the system level. I think for most of our IR scholars knows that, and the tennis walls said that there are three levels of analysis, individual, the state, and the uh, uh, system. So I use uh, uh, for uh, for walls, the key concern that uh, it's impossible to use a uh, uh, variable at uh, a one level analysis to explain the change in the other uh, level uh, uh, situation. But I actually, I did. I think that we can use the uni uh, uh, individual level analysis to explain the change in system, uh, uh, system level. Second, and this is uh, maybe provoking. And uh, my theory challenged the liberalist uh, uh, theory, mainly the liberalist institutional theory. And the liberal institutional theory strongly emphasized the role of the inter institution. So they regarded institution as an independent variable. They concern the difference of institution would decide the growth of the country and the strengths and the change at the international level. And actually, I think the current case, especially in the United States, and the trend and the shows the, uh, the, uh, to us, American institutions cannot constrain Trump's uh, policy. And uh, Trump can do what and against the institution required. So why it happened? I think the mechanism is like this. 
because all institutions have to function through human beings. All functions have to social functions or or the uh, uh, political function uh, uh, institutions have to function through leadership. Leaders has the power; they can shape institution, they can change, they can modify, they can even damage and change the institution. So that's why that, that's my argument. The national leadership plays a moral than institution in the chain of the world, in the growth of the uh, uh, national capability. And uh, so I think this is uh, uh, something uh, happened not only to the US, not only to China. So if we look at the situation in Russia and in uh, Turkey, in uh, UK, and uh, uh, in uh, several countries. And you find that the leaders can change the country and with the same institution. And uh, we will have different leader with the same institution and you find that they will make the country grow sometimes the could be faster or could be slower. So that's why this theory uh, possibly is uh, a little bit difficult for uh, 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 institution believers to accept uh, because they believe institutions still play more fundamental role than uh, uh, leadership. Well, that's it. <clears throat> Thank you, Professor. Really appreciate it. So now I I proceed with some few comments. So uh, we can have time to do a Q&A with the student and the scholar. So remember, uh, we would like to collect this question, the question of the, the scholar and the student in, the, in a chat. So uh, leadership and the rise of the great powers, which aim to explore international leadership and the mechanisms behind power transition, could not be more timely. This is an insightful and carefully written book that provides a new theory that explains why few rising states had been able to replace, replace the dominant state. So, Professor Jan's answer is the quality of uh, political leadership. This uh, leadership capability is based on the leadership capacity for reform and hold international strategic credibility, without which a country cannot will global authority. The most important theoretical contribution of the book, in my, my perspective, is in challenging a systematic approach to international relations, but it brings down the level of analyst, analyze, analysis of, uh, to the individual. At the core of Jan So on political leadership is an attempt to formulate a theory which can identify the mechanisms why, by which individuals, as political leaders of the great powers, can change power structure at the systemic level. So political leadership is not easy to use as a theoretical variable. This differs from the standard realist theory which largely emphasizes in relative power as the key variable in both state <coughs> behavior and international outcomes. So the key difficult is to find a way to define a, a leadership in a theoretically usable manner, especially because the, of the problem of the tautology. So if we define a leadership as a human leadership based on its behavior, how then can we use this characterization to predict this behavior? So here, here the professor Jan leave us a challenge for a scholar of international relations. So we should think of developing typologies of regime to predict their behavior. So I am sure that will be a, a, fruitful, a fruitful avenue for future 
research. So last but not least, uh, it seems that, that Russia is an underrepresented player in this approach. So I would like to end by leaving a question about it. So Professor Jan, uh, assuming a bipolar world, world between China and the United States, what could be the role of Russia? I, I, say, I, say, I try to say also uh, on Sunday, uh, Professor Mesha Haima uh, suggest uh, to Argentine journalists that the United States should approach Russia similarly as Kissinger and Nixon in the 70s with China. So uh, next we will begin with the question. Uh, our research assistant, Christina, will proceed to read them in three rounds of the three questions. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, so, uh, Christina, please. You, mark, you want me to kill? So, uh, I, I, I just will, at the moment we have uh, two, two questions, right? Christina? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I can repeat them. Yeah. Uh, Okay, we have this, the, the third one, so I, I will just uh, share with you. Uh, so we can start with this three first question. Let me, one second. This, this will be the third one. Okay. Great. Uh, th thank you, Christina. Okay, I'm going to repeat the one that you already said. Um, mm -hmm. Assuming a bipolar world between China and the United States, what role uh, do you think Russia would have? Um, the second question, considering the history of the United States and Latin America and uh, the Cold War or this new Cold War between Trump and China, do you think China will have a more intense cooperation agenda with Latin America? And the last one, um, how do you envision the configuration of the international system will be if Joe Binden wins the November elections. Would he be a more conventional and less disruptive leader? Um, or would the tensions between the US and China continue to grow? Thank you, Professor. I will unmute your phone. Yes. OK. Uh, well, uh, first a question about the, Rus the role of the Russia. Well, uh, when we're talking about uh, uh, the role of the interstate, state, and now, generally speaking, and we have talking about their capability, and uh, any country, their influence on the global issues or the international affairs, and based on their capability. So generally speaking, the Russia, by this moment, and that their capability is uh, no longer superpower, and even among the major powers, it's not the strongest one. Although US and uh, Russia have the largest uh, uh, nuclear arsenal, but their economy is uh, too small. The, Russian, the size of the Russian GDP is uh, even less than South Korea. You know, it's, so, it's less than South Korea. So with that kind of uh, Mature capability, and the Russia have a, still have a, have influence in Europe, in uh, uh, neighbors, but Russia cannot have the influence beyond this region. So we cannot see Russians' influence in Latin America, in uh, uh, Africa, in uh, Australia, and uh, even in, uh, on the, uh, the Iran or the other things. So their influence. And uh, it's uh, limited. And uh, for all of the, uh, it, not only the Russia and the other major powers, and uh, even the UK, and the UK's withdrawal from the EU, then what? Only have impact on Europe. And the, no, the countries in the other continent and beyond Europe, and do not just talking about it, that, but no one can feel any impact on their life. Second, about the China's policy toward the US. China and uh, very eager to keep 
cooperative relationship with the uh, U.S. But from my understanding, and the uh, U.S. said, wait a minute, and the U.S. adopted a decoupling strategy, decouple who? Decouple China. And the U.S. do not want to cooperate with China because Trump administration believe and the China benefit more from the cooperation with the U.S. than the United States. So his policy is very clear. Cut off the cooperation and then you know, don't let China benefit from the cooperation. So even China want to cooperate with the U.S. and it was frequently rejected by the United States. Something about the global leadership. First, and the uh, U.S. is still the largest power in the world, strongest country in the world. So the U.S. should provide global public good or global leadership. Unfortunately, and the Trump administration make it very clear, and the U.S. has no interest in providing global leadership in that way because it's too costly, because the Americans do not benefit from it, because the China benefit from the globalization more than U.S. And so the U.S. decided to shape off in global leadership. So that's why we see the U.S. withdraw from one after another the institutions of the United Nations and the China. And many countries expect China to provide a global leadership. Unfortunately, I think that's beyond China's capability. Leadership is based on your capability. Global leadership based on global capability. So that's why during the Cold War, and the U.S. cannot provide global leadership, and that he had to share the global power with the Soviet Union. And the U.S. only provided global leadership after the Cold War, when Soviet Union collapsed. So in the future, at least a decade, 10 years, and we possibly will face a world without global leadership. This situation may last for two, three, and even four decades. That's it. Thank you, Professor. So now, Christina, please, we can continue with the second round of questions. Yep. Um, a few times, Deng Xiaoping, I hope I pronounced that name properly, um, has made the comment that China will always be a third world country. Even it became, even if it became rich and powerful, what would that mean for the global South? Um, how could China's leadership reflect that third worldism? Um, how does China's approaches to moral leadership to countries that function in a democratic way, moral leadership defined not in how national interest is achieved, but what national interest ought to be? Uh, and the last one, the new concept of common destiny of mankind is being proposed by the Chinese government at international level. What is the precise meaning of that concept for changing international norms for the acceptance, transformation and acceptance of international law um, in respect of human rights? A key pillar of post-World War II, uh, of the post-World War II international system and for the organization of socioeconomic co um, cooperation collectively or in a hub and uh, spoke system. Should I respond to these questions? Yes, please, Professor. Oh, wait for more. Sh should I respond to these three questions or yes, wait yes. for more questions? Yeah, no, no, I, I think the, the second round, only, only, only two questions, and then we can continue with the last round with uh, three more questions. Okay. Well, uh, first uh, about uh, China's uh, international identity. Deng Xiaoping once said, even we become as rich as a developed country, and still and uh, man, uh, maintain the identity as uh, a developing country. What does it mean? From my understanding, that means uh, 
political identity rather than economic identity. So it means uh, economically, possibly we are richer than all of those uh, third world countries or developing countries. But politically, we will still take sides with the developing countries. That's why China by now still resists the identity as a developing country. From my understanding, it's no longer uh, the, the developing country, the identity of developing country for China is no longer based on economic concept, based on economic standing, and it's become the political standing. And what I mean uh, being a developing country? Being a developed country means that, okay, the world is unfair. The developing country do not have the same power and as much as the developed country. So we should make the developing country have the same power like the developed country. So that means a change, a, a shape, a new world order. Second question is about the morality. In what way and China will adopt the uh, 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 provide a moral leadership for the world. First, I would say the moral realism is my personal theory. By now, I have not adopted by my government. <laughs> I don't know whether my government will adopt my theory and uh, as the official uh, uh, principle, whether they want to use my theory to guide their foreign policy. And uh, I'm not, I don't know. But at least at this moment, and the government didn't show any interest in my theory. And I would say, what do I mean morality for uh, international leadership? Morality of international leadership, it doesn't mean that uh, that country and uh, concern or take care of others' countries' interests first. No. And even China maintain the identity as a developing country. It doesn't mean that China will concern that make a foreign policy and based on the interests of the developing countries. It's certainly based on its own interests first. But then in what way is a morality, a, a, a moral? It moral means that I certainly adopt a policy based on my interests. Meanwhile, I do not want to hurt others' interests. If there's a conflict between my interests with your interests, we can negotiate about how to find the middle point, how to find an approach to achieve the win-win uh, uh, situation. So how to turn the zero-sum game into a win-win game. So that means morality. So international morality, if we define it, very, very narrow. It, what I mean? It means uh, undertake international responsibility. Have a good international strategic credibility. Okay. So what I mean re responsibility? Responsibility means that you implement what you sign. You implement and what you promise. You keep your promise good. And so it doesn't mean that he's now and uh, uh, to his enemies, no matter how much the country was hurt by the enemy, by rivalry, and that they still be now to them. No. It means that they keep their promise good. If they say that if the country promise to help a country, he should do it. If he keep promise, keep promise his Friends will punish any or narrowly defined as the international strategic credibility of the term, the human. Uh, a uh, human, uh, a common destiny of the uh, of human. Well, actually, I found that recently the Chinese government officially trans translated the term 
人类命运共同体 into the common future of a, 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 a humanity. So they're talking about a common future. And uh, so the common future for medicine, it doesn't mean exactly the same as a community. Community is based on what? Based on common interests. We have the EU, that's a community, right? European community. And uh, before the uh, uh, European Union, community based on common interests. So if we talk about the community of humanity, and then we are talking about a common interest we share. But now if you translate the term into the common future, that means uh, we have the same future. Could be good, could be bad. If bad, we suffer together. If good, we share together. So now it is from my understanding, the term, and uh, actually it's a, a debatable in China, and uh, there are not a very clear definition for it. And uh, the people are still studying and uh, the continent, the uh, component of uh, this term. Thank you, Professor. So now we will continue with the last round of question. So please, uh, Christina. Yes, uh, the last round I'm going to divide into two different categories. So the first one is more about world regions. Um, those are two questions. Um, what do you think about the leadership and influence of India? And how complex or even not is the view of the Chinese allied about Latin America and compared with other regions, what do you think are the main issues that are important for Beijing when engaging Latin America. Do you think China will have a more intense cooperation with Latin America? And the second category, how does moral realism conceive China's cooperation policy as an instrument of foreign policy or as a principle? Um, you keep saying that reform is always necessary for a country to rise, but what kind of reform are you referring to? And the last one, um, countries that behave politically in a democratic way are slaves of the national interest dilemma, just as you argued as well, but do not necessarily have a political, do not necessarily have political leaders that respond only to programs, um, but also elections. And this looks like a difficulty for China to portray, portray itself as a soft power with political leadership, but rather um, with big political, with a big political value for the good or for the bad. What does your theory bring regarding to this difficulty? What does it bring to it? Well, well, very good questions. And uh, let's start from the very first one with the Indian. And uh, actually, I'm not an expert on Indian study. So I have very limited knowledge of the Modi. And the Modi provide a very nationalist uh, leadership. And uh, even in India, and people call him national, uh, nationalist leader. <clears throat> His policy in the first term, and tilted uh, uh, toward the reform and the opening up. But the second term, from my understanding, he shaped the direction of his uh, policy. He shaped towards the uh, so-called self-independence. So you see, and the last uh, month, and uh, he suddenly ordered to uh, stop and uh, 49 Chinese APP. And uh, this APP is a pure economic uh, uh, program and for people you know. And uh, uh, all then why? From my understanding, he's talking about the Indian uh, independence, economic independence, uh, security independence, military independence, everything, independent from uh, 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 interdependence with other countries. So in that way, I, I believe and the Indians growth and cannot be as high as the people expected. And the people in the world and uh, actually uh, hope 
Indian's economy growing faster than Chinese economy. Unfortunately, it didn't happen. My understanding, it could not happen. The reason is very simple, because the Indian do not want to open itself. And the Indian is very much more democratic than China, but Indian is much less open than China. China is not that democratic like Indian, but China is much open than the Indian. So without an open policy, and I, I doubt Indian can make its economy grow to grow as fast as the Chinese economy. Second, about the Latin American. So how important Latin America to uh, China? And uh, I would say Latin America is only economically important to China because the geographical location is far from China. And in terms of politics, and the Latin America cannot provide the same political support like uh, African countries. Africa have uh, 40, uh, 54 countries. They dominate the votes in the UN. And the Latin American countries cannot dominate the votes in the UN. And the Latin America is so close to the US. US regards Latin America as a backyard. So China do not want to have any conflicts with the US in this region. So China very consciously control it's a political uh, policy in Latin America to avoid any political, military, cultural conflicts with the US. China do not want to compete with the US in the other uh, sectors except economy. So from my understanding, Latin America is mainly economically important to China, not politically, culturally, and militarily. The last question, uh, the third question is about multilateralism. And the China officially advocate the multilateralism. Then the question is, how much China can implement that? And actually from my understanding, multilateralism, and it depends on what? Depends on the mutual interaction. And the China advocated multilateralism, not like the Germany, Germany can, implement a multilateral policy within the EU because the, there's a historically provided that uh, arena as the uh, EU for uh, 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 Germany to implement a multilateral diplomacy. Beyond Europe and Germany still cannot make it it's a multilateral diplomacy efficient, efficient. The same, and in East Asia, by now, you find that there is no very effective uh, regional institution. The regional institution in Africa, in Middle East, in Latin America, is the, are more efficient than the regional institutions in East Asia. The reason is that because the competition between the US and the China make no regional institution can function well. So in that way, China can only, from my understanding, China will do this kind of multilateral in a different way. So China do it in what way? Like this way. China, Africa. China, Latin America. China, Europe. China, Middle East. So on the one side is China. On the other side is many countries. So this kind of multilateralism for the other countries concerned. It's only semi. It's a semi multilateralism. It's, a, it's not a pure multilateralism. That is a, 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 the situation. The last question about the political values. Actually, Chinese government uh, uh, highly advocate its own political value. But this value, from my understanding, are different. Political value are different from most of the countries. Most of the countries have the similar political system like United States. And have the elections. China, so China 
system only similar with the port or body, export or political system. But meanwhile, China tell the world, we do not want to copy or learn and emit your political value and your political system. So for a very long time, I think China will continue to use the term everything with Chinese characteristic. So always with the Chinese characteristic means what different from others. That's it. So in terms of ideology, and China very recently, and the deputy uh, foreign minister, and uh, the foreign minister, and uh, make an announcement, uh, uh, deliver a, a speeches, and the very clear, China do not want to have a ideological competition with the United States. China looking for the peaceful coexistence of a different values and different civilization and uh, political systems. So that's it. Okay. Thank, thank you, Professor. So uh, we are almost on time. So the idea is to finish uh, 10.30. So uh, what do you think? Uh, do, do, you, do you want a last question or we can just stop, stop here? We have five minutes. Your so, micro is off. Sorry, Professor. Your micro is off. Yeah, Professor. You, oh, um, I think we can continue for another 10 minutes or for other questions. Yeah, yeah, we have uh, uh, two more questions. So, uh, so I think the topic is not the same, but uh, please, Christina, we can continue with the, the question 11, 11 and 12. Okay, uh, you have talked about the influence of think tanks um, on the government in China. Could you, um, could you deepen a little, like, could you talk a little about, a bit more about uh, the topic and the influence on that? Okay. And the other question, yeah. very unrelated to that, uh, <laughs> in the, <laughs> in okay. the South, South Sea of China, um, as we all know, there are different, different disputes on the maritime uh, boundaries, incidents with fishermen and coast guards and those claims. Uh, facing a possible engagement between the U.S. and China in the South, the South Sea of China, how do you see the profile of the leaders for limiting any misunderstanding? Okay, uh, the last questions, uh, the last two questions. Yes, and the first uh, about the think tank. Uh, because we are all scholars of the international studies, so we certainly hope our ideas with our thought have impact on policy making <laughs> in every country the same. Unfortunately, my understanding and uh, that's a kind of hope are always uh, um, uh, being uh, disappointed. And uh, usually we believe Americans think tank uh, very powerful. They have a strong impact on the uh, policy making. But now you look at the Trump's situation and the no uh, uh, think tanks, and no any, including Republicans, including the conservative think tanks, including the, the what are the uh, enterprises, <laughs> traditional enterprises uh, 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 center, and the, no think tanks have any impact on Trump's policy making. He is a, is a very personal. And uh, sometimes he announced his policy and without his uh, assistance, I mean, a close assistance, uh, know, uh, knowing about it. So what do I want to, what I want to uh, argument I want to make? Actually, how much think tanks has impacted on the policy maker depends on the policy maker itself. If the policy makers is a type of person and willing to listen to different opinions, you gave a concern about different opinions. And then what? He said, okay, think tanks is really important because I can always learn from their different ideas because I find that their ideas are different from me, but it's helpful and favorable to my interests. And their ideas and helpful 
to the national interest. And so this really depends on the uh, leadership. So if you look at this, and how much, we, we, that's why we always say, hey, how much, how closer the think tank uh, uh, is to the uh, lead, uh, leadership. So my understanding is not how, much, how close you are to the leaders, it's how much the leaders want you to be closer to. And so that's my understanding. So in China, the same. And the general speaking, I think uh, most of think tanks has no impact on policy making. Policy making made by leaders, mainly based on the bureaucracy's uh, 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 reports, rather than the, the, the ideas or reports and consultants by the, uh, the, the think tanks, no. And uh, I find that especially and in uh, this age, and we find that there's a kind of a change and that there's a lot of uh, uh, strong leadership and most of strong leaders, uh, they, they, they are very reluctant and uh, to listen. They're not upset, they, they're reluctant to listen to the think tank side. And the come to uh, the South China Sea. South China Sea is uh, become the hot pot. And at this moment, it's not because the problem between China and the US, uh, a maritime disputes between China and the uh, uh, related countries and the turning, uh, uh, turning hot. There's nothing, nothing changed. Everything's the same. And China has maintained the relationship with the uh, uh, South China Sea's countries uh, as Europe. Uh, no matter it's good or bad, it's still the same. Actually, the, the hot situation is kicked out by whom? The US. And the US suddenly shaped its uh, policy towards the South China Sea. And the, before uh, last month, and the US said that US take no signs, no uh, 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 stance on the disputes between China and the other countries. Oh, the, actually, the, mar, uh, the maritime disputes are not only between China with others, and also between the, all of these other related countries. And uh, so U.S. said that, said that they won't take stand on these disputes. Suddenly, and the Trump, uh, uh, Pompeo make announcement, America changed its policy towards South China Sea. Last month, and the U.S. said that, they oppose China's stance. Well, because the U.S. changes its policy towards South China Sea, make the situation become hard. Nowadays, I think more and more people are talking about it. how much the Trump administration will decide, it, make a determination to, cause, to kick off a war in South China Sea. Now people in China, my understanding, a lot of uh, uh, scholars or the amateurs of uh, IR relations and these, uh, these people and I said, looking for, hey, which islands US is going to attack first? So you see now all of the, and also the surrounding countries in the uh, South China Sea, they're talking about where America will attack first. So actually the current situation is caused by America's uh, new policy towards South China Sea and the very reason. So if US do not want to have a war in this region, I don't think that there's any war will occur. But if US want to have a war, it 100% will happen because the US will take the initiative. They have the strongest uh, Navy in the world. They can attack, they can make a decision, attack the any islands, every country, every, uh, any facility uh, in this region. So I don't know how much uh, Trump admin administration decided to have a war in this region or not. But anyhow, and the people said, you cannot rule out any possibility and that Trump may take. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, for this interesting presentation, Professor Yan, and bringing Thank you very much. some interesting new thought on this topic. 
uh, thank you for taking your time, especially considering the big time difference, and that is quite thank you. Thank you very much. For you already. Dorothea, okay. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank and thanks for thank a very you. interesting presentation. Y thanks to everybody. Muchas gracias a todos y los esperamos con el embajador de Irlanda a las 12. Yeah. All of you are welcome much. to visit our university whenever you have chance to uh, come to Beijing. Okay. Thank you, Professor. <laughs> on the summer. On the summer. Yeah. <laughs> Next okay. Okay. Best Thanks regards. Thank you, Thank you very good. much. Good. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Okay. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye bye. Sure.